God, amen? And, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we need to realize He does good. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have bad things happen to you, but uh, uh, you have to realize God's still in control. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I know you've heard me read the uh, missionary letters about Brother Childs and uh, uh, some of the things he's gone through uh, physically. And uh, he's just uh, gone through a lot of things in a very short amount of time, if I remember correctly. And uh, his wife, uh, dear wife, was just uh, uh, still faithful. She sent out a couple of the letters, if I remember correctly. Uh, I think there was like maybe three or four of them that uh, you may have sent out. Uh, but uh, uh, anyways, uh, just uh, really good to see him uh, staying faithful and uh, uh, doing what God's called him to do. And, and uh, so without any further ado, uh, I'll have him uh, come, and uh, you be sure to give him your undivided attention here tonight. Uh, some of you uh, have never met him. He actually came during COVID. We were talking about that, and uh, uh, they, we had just literally had just started meeting all together. We had uh, originally started off uh, meeting in separate rooms, and uh, I think they came uh, for like two weeks. We had some additional seating, but uh, nobody sat in there, so we took it away, and I think they came the third week. So I think we had just taken away all the additional seating. Uh, it was uh, in May of 2020, if I remember correctly, uh, about that time, and uh, we went out to Olive Garden. You remember that? Okay, I remember that. Uh, we went to Olive Garden because it was still kind of weird. Uh, they were having everybody kind of still, you know, social distance and all that. And, and uh, uh, I told him, I said, oh, we're not worried about it, amen. Uh, but uh, anyways, it's, it's good to have him here. Uh, so you give him your undivided attention here tonight as he brings the word of life to us. All right. I'm, I think I'm live. Amen. All right, good. That's uh, that's great. Well, let me um, <clears throat> let me begin uh, with a little bit of an update on our ministry and uh, what has been uh, happening overseas in South Africa. And um, it's been a it's been a joy uh, to be there now for three years, and uh, we're excited about what God has for us. In the next term, and I'll say about that a little bit more about that uh, in just a moment. But uh, uh, we went uh, to the city of Cape Town, uh, which is now approximately four and a half million people and growing still uh, quite uh, uh, quickly. Uh, I uh, imagine the next time that we uh, meet here, it will be well over five. It, it is just amazing how fast that city is growing. Uh, but we are. Uh, part of a team of missionaries that has, has been working in Calvary Bible Baptist Church there in uh, one of the, the communities in the suburbs of, New, of um, Cape Town there. The community is called North Pine. Uh, we just recently had the church, in fact, actually uh, a year ago, October, the church was able to purchase their own building, which actually moves them away from North Pine a little bit into an industrial park. But we're there excited about uh, the future and seeing what God has for them as they are now able to impact even a greater area being uh, where they are. And so it's exciting. Uh, they have not yet been able to meet in that building. Uh, they are still going through some red tape uh, with um, uh, the government and trying to get permission as it's not exactly zoned for religious worship. Uh, so a lot of different things that they're working through. And you've read up on some of that. I'll also be sending out a prayer letter later this week. And you'll read a little bit more. Uh, one key thing that is uh, waiting is kind of hindering things at the present, uh, which uh, my coworker does not uh, feel it will be uh, a major uh, deal. And that is because of the industrial park, there's limited parking, and we are needing to seek permission from other business owners uh, that we uh, for permission to use their parking spaces, even though we're outside of normal operating business hours. Uh, it's still being required of us to seek permission. And so uh, already some have uh, gotten back, as I understand it, and have given permission. So that's exciting. Just waiting for a few more uh, to, to uh, do so. And then uh, uh, just some remodel work and things like that. And, and the church will be in their own building. And they're excited about that. Um, our our uh, responsibility on the field has been primarily with youth. Uh, we've also taken care of, obviously, 
uh, music, and we've had some outreach opportunities and things like that just uh, in the church ministries. Uh, but youth has been our primary focus, and we're excited to see what God has been doing with these teenagers. And again, you've read some of, uh, of the uh, great reports there of how God's been working. We're excited about uh, just the, the young people that are coming regularly. Uh, when we arrived, uh, we were probably, I'm just estimating, but we were probably about four or five uh, regularly attending, and then we've had several that have grown up in the church and, and uh, come along, and now they're in the youth uh, ministry, and we've had some new faces recently starting to come, and so we've seen that uh, the ministry grow in our church bo uh, body there, and the family uh, grow from about five to 12, so that's exciting. But on Friday nights, we include uh, two other sister churches, and so they come for uh, every other week for youth night. And uh, the, the, the Friday before we left, which would have been about the 5th or 6th of September, whatever the date was, uh, we hit our high at, I think it was like 27 or 28. And these, these young people uh, really do represent uh, the future of South Africa, the future of these churches. Um, the, when I was uh, preparing for, uh, I was hoping to have a video presentation, then you wouldn't have to hear me so uh, long, but uh, um, it was not completed in time. But as I was doing some preparation for that video, um, I learned, I did not know this, but 40% of South Africa's population, and Cape Town is very similar if you look at uh, their statistics as well, 40% are under the age of 25. And 60, I believe 6% are under the age of 40. That means two-thirds of the country's population are my age or younger. And so as you're thinking about church planning in South Africa, you're, you're going to have a very young congregation. And that's thrilling um, because the, the opportunity to disciple young lives and bring them uh, along in the faith and just really challenge them to live for God is, it is really staggering, mind-blowing, uh, the opportunity that's before us. So we're excited what God has been doing. Uh, my wife, as we were um, uh, concluding, and I should, let me, let me make the general statement that I'll, I'll mention what my wife was able to do. Uh, we have seen through that uh, teenagers that have been saved and baptized, joining the church and my wife was starting uh, discipleship with one of our young ladies uh, before we left. Unfortunately, we weren't able to complete the lessons, uh, but she is, and her mom both, uh, we are excited. They will be baptized soon. I don't know when. Uh, we don't have our own building, so we don't have our own baptistry, so we're borrowing one of our uh, church members' swimming pools, and right now it is winter uh, coming into spring. So they're waiting for a little bit warmer weather, uh, but she is excited about being baptized and joining the church right away. And it's just a thrill to see what God is doing. It's, it's an exciting time uh, for uh, the church. And again, as we think of just the potential of these young lives, I mean, there's our pastors and our deacons and our, uh, our evangelists and, I believe, future missionaries to other uh, parts of Africa and the world. So I'm excited with what God's doing and also faithful church members. We need those as well. And so I'm excited to see what God's doing in those uh, young lives. Um, but most people uh, are wondering and they know about uh, the situation we went through this last year. And as Pastor mentioned, it was fast. It, we, uh, we, my wife and I had left for a short vacation. We had uh, spent several, you know, two years, I believe it was. Um, no break, just kind of doing what we needed to do in the ministry. And we had just come through a very busy June, July and so we decided we're going to take a few days, we're going to get apart and, and uh, just take a little vacation. So we did, and toward the end of that vacation, I started not feeling well. And uh, long story short, after about four weeks of not eating and losing a lot of weight, if you want to lose weight, that's a great diet. Stop eating. Uh, it works every single time. Um, my wife got concerned, of course, and I, was, I just thought a little more rest, um, take another uh, take another pill or something of that nature, and I thought I'd be fine, uh, but it did not uh, happen that way, and after about four weeks of that kind of uh, illness, just 
hanging on. My wife convinced me to go to the doctor, so I did, kicking and screaming. Uh, I don't like doctors, and some of you men can relate. Some of you ladies probably can as well. Uh, I avoid them as much as I can. Unfortunately, now that's not possible. So um, I went into the doctor, and uh, he was very concerned. Something to him just did not seem right about the color in my face and sent me for blood work. And as it turned out, I was very anemic. In fact, actually, uh, I don't know how much longer I could have lasted. Uh, My hemoglobin had dropped from 13, which is somewhat normal, 13 and a half. I was down at about 6 and uh, rapidly dropping. Uh, So I don't know, um, you know, that, you know, the situation there, how long I would have been able to live, but we caught it just in time. The Lord is good that way. But through that, the Lord revealed uh, that I had uh, cancer, and stage three is what I was diagnosed as, and that started off this last year of, I would say, probably my greatest trial to date. And maybe, who knows, I don't know what uh, the future holds. It could be the, the, the biggest one uh, ever, but uh, to date, certainly, and that was a major trial uh, emergency surgery to remove about nine inches of my colon and uh, the colostomy and then chemotherapy. I had eight rounds of that. And then um, uh, we uh, were just back in the States for a short time in May and June and then returned back to have a second surgery to reverse all of that. And as you probably can guess, it's easier to take it apart than it is to put together. But God was gracious and uh, everything is back working and doctors are happy they let me come. Government was going to kick me out anyway, but the doctors gave their A-OK And so we were able to travel back for our furlough, and it's just been a uh, it's been a roller coaster uh, of a year uh, for us. And as Pastor said, my wife was faithful uh, to stand by my side. Uh, I I remember a couple of times apologizing to her for putting her through this, and she said, "For better, for worse." That's what we agreed to. So uh, she stuck it out, and the Lord, uh, I'm sure, will bless her for that. Uh, We are excited about returning to the field already. Uh, We're missing our people in our home uh, there. It's it's been a joy. It really has. Uh, But uh, this next term, I was telling Pastor before the service, we're excited uh, because just a few months prior to my cancer diagnosis, God began to work in our heart and things that we were already aware of but really started to um, apply them to our own hearts and lives. Uh, I love being an assistant pastor. Brother, you have got it good because the buck stops here and you don't have to worry about it, right? Um, No, it it really is. It's a joy to work uh, alongside of a a seasoned man of God. It is is a a joy and a blessing uh, to grow and to learn under someone's ministry and to to be uh, taught and mentored. That That is a blessing. And I really thought, uh, that I would continue in that role for a, uh, I was happy to do so for the rest of my life, uh, working with young people. I love teenagers, and, uh, and uh, so I thought that would be, uh, my co-worker and I would just partner together, and we'd just do the work of the ministry as long as God kept the two of us together as a team. Uh, but about a month or two ahead of my cancer diagnosis, the Lord changed all of those plans, and then through the, the cancer uh, of course, I wasn't able to be around uh, people as often as we had hoped. And so there was a natural distancing uh, between us and the church and just kind of their lives continued on while my life felt like I was sitting still. Uh, but through that time, the Lord confirmed to us that he was actually going to be moving us uh, from our current ministry at Calvary and then into something we really don't know what to, uh, what to tell you, um, whether we'll uh, be church planning a brand new work or starting or, or taking over an existing work that needs a pastor and then from there starting to plant other churches. I don't know what it looks like. In fact, I've been telling folks, my parents my uh, included and others that have asked, if you have a question about our future ministry, I have a great answer for you. I don't know. <laughs> and that will be the answer to every question you ask on that, uh, on that front. I don't know what God has for us. Uh, where are you going? I don't know. I just know we're staying in the Cape Town area and uh, close, at least for now, 
close to my doctors and make sure everything's still fine. Uh, there are, there, you can, if you had a map of Cape Town laid out, you can pretty much put your finger anywhere. There's a need for a solid independent fundamental Baptist church. So we can go anywhere in the city. And so uh, right now, um, we have no idea where we're going, but we're going, and we're excited. We'll continue to keep some connection with the church, and of course, the youth is already on a Friday night blended, and we plan to um, be involved with that and maybe even continue to lead that for a time until we can uh, officially train a replacement or, or whatever that looks like. We're, we're talking with our coworkers about uh, what that transition, but this year... Uh, I'm sorry, this coming term the, uh, will be a transitional term for us, and we are thrilled to death. Uh, it's just an exciting time to see uh, communities that really are in need of the gospel, uh, thinking of all of the potential that is there to reach people uh, for Christ. And it is just an exciting time. Uh, so if you would be praying for us uh, during uh, this furlough as we're traveling, of course, and uh, as you as you can well imagine, there's a lot of miles to travel, uh, new beds to sleep in, and around uh, people. So just pray that uh, God will give safety as we travel, health as we are uh, with folks as well. And then for uh, our church back there, Calvary, that God would uh, do a work in our absence with our young people and continue to do a work. And then as we transition uh, into a new ministry, we're excited and uh, we just need God to give wisdom and direction. And I know he will, uh, but that's what we need at this time. So if you uh, pray for us, if you have not gotten a prayer card, uh, we do have some on the back table. You're welcome to uh, stop by, uh, get one of those cards. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please ask. And if we know, we'll tell you. And if we don't, we'll say, I don't know. And, uh, but we, will, uh, we would enjoy uh, getting to meet you and... Uh, reconnecting with some of you as well. It's been, uh, uh, you said 2020 we were figuring, so now it's been four years, and uh, it'd be great to, uh, uh, some of the younger ones have now gotten a little taller, and uh, some of the rest of us have gotten a little bigger, and so it'll be great to reconnect. And so stop by the table, and uh, we, will, we will enjoy some fellowship after the service this evening. As I was um, going through uh, chemo, as I mentioned this had to be the most difficult thing we had to face. I will admit that. It was, it was, it was rough. Um, I was almost 40 when I found out. And when you're 40, you never expect to hear uh, a doctor tell you that you have cancer. I mean, you don't expect it at any age, but it just seems like um, at my age or younger, it seems so foreign uh, to think that we would have to face this. And there was a lot of unknowns. I, I, I did not, some, there were days I did not know how to do anything regarding my treatments. I, it just, it was a, it was a blur. Uh, it, was, it was confusing. There was a lot of questions that needed to be answered. <clears throat> I just didn't know how to handle it. Um, Sitting in that hospital, I, I had to have a blood transfusion. Um, the, the, the blood count was so low, it, my doctor said, there's no way you're going to be able to recoup this on your own. And we, we went through that, and that was difficult, but we got through it. And then uh, the CT scan, after, I'm almost immediately following, within just a few hours of that, I'm, I'm in the CT scan, and I'm getting the results, and I'm looking at the screen. And the doctor shows me, the surgeon shows me what he sees, the abnormality in my abdomen. And, uh, but he's, he's confident it's not a problem. Don't worry about it. It's just something strange. We're going to go in, we're going to look, we're going to see what it is. If it's a problem, we'll take it out. If it's not, you know, you'll be fine. To him coming back on that Thursday and saying, I'm not sure, I'm not 100% certain, but it looks like cancer, but we have to wait for results. And we had a weekend to go through, and then it was a holiday on Monday, and so we had to wait till Tuesday. So those days from Thursday afternoon 
to Tuesday when he came back in and gave us the, the, the information that we were looking for. Those were difficult days. Just going back, and, and if I might even just say this, it was Thursday a year ago. So just, just a few days ago was my one-year anniversary of the official diagnosis. And I'm sitting there in that hospital room, confused. I'm questioning. God, I don't understand why. Going through a range of emotions, you know. But probably the biggest one for me was fear. Now, I will say this, as I've mentioned already, I don't like doctors. Not personally, I'm sure they're great people, but not for me. You want to go to the doctor, have fun. I don't consider that fun. I, I prefer to stay, and I've always been healthy. And uh, so I, I, I don't enjoy uh, doctor visits, even routine checkups. I don't enjoy them at all. Uh, so to go through this was a challenge and really a fearful time for me. And then to sit there on the, and wait that weekend and finally get to Tuesday and the surgeon walks in and says it's cancer. Stage 3B and you're going to need chemotherapy and I'm going to send a, an oncologist in and we, we talk for a few minutes. My wife wasn't even in the room. I was the only one there that morning. And it hit like a ton of bricks on your chest because everything now has changed. It's not just the fear of the unknown. I have a great fear of needles. That's why I don't like doctors. They have sharp, pointy things that they stick in you. And uh, so I knew chemotherapy was going to be a lot of needles. And I was going to have to face some of the the the... Uh, most difficult fears that I have ever had over my life that, thus far. By the way, I still don't like needles. I've gotten through them, but I don't like them. I will still avoid them if I can. I spoke to the oncologist, and he asked us to consider what our... I mean, he gave me his opinion. He gave me his uh, uh, the fact that he agreed with the diagnosis, but um, he told me, he said, you're going to have to make a decision um, are you going to have treatment here or are you going to have it back in the States? Well, we started contacting people. What do you think we should do? Uh, I have some, obviously our parents were involved in that conversation and my pastor was greatly involved in that. Uh, deacons of our church uh, gave some input uh, to pastor and kind of you know, he funneled it to us. I have some very dear counselors to me uh, that I, I asked them to pray and just ask God to give us wisdom. A lot of decisions. God ultimately gave us peace to stay right where we were. The medical was, was fantastic. And now looking back on it, we're glad we did. I mean, we have no complaints uh, about the treatment that I received. But I remember it was the day before my first chemotherapy treatment. And I remember sitting there on my bed. At the time, of course, I was still very sore from uh, surgeries and the recovery, and I knew that I was uh, going to be back in uh, treatment where I needed to be kind of, I didn't feel well. We have a little dog, and I, so we uh, didn't want her getting too excited, so I actually moved to the guest room for uh, you know a few days after my treatments and things. So I was getting ready and I was sitting on that bed just alone with God, and I'm questioning, and I'm scared, and I'm, um, I'm asking God, okay, I'm about to face this thing that I've never faced before, and you've, I've heard all the horror stories of chemotherapy, and Lord, I don't know how I'm going to face this. I remember telling the Lord, I remember people, and, and by the way, people were emailing us, and they were sending words of encouragement and Bible verses that they had uh, found helpful to them, and none of them brought comfort to me directly. But I remember saying, Lord, I, I just remember something I read some time ago. I couldn't remember where. I 
think it's in Psalms. So, but Lord, I remember the verse talks about how you hold us up with your right hand. I said, and, and, and I think it also talks about you holding our hand. I said, I'm about to go in. And, and when I face a needle, you know how I have found the best way to handle a needle? Hold somebody's hand. I'm 40 years old. I'll still hold a hand. And just let me squeeze, brother. You know, here we go. Um, I had uh, my second surgery here in June. I had um, part of the incision opened. It was bleeding a lot. We're trying to control it. And finally, the surgeon says, you're going to need extra stitches. And I went, oh, no, that means another needle. He says, actually, it's going to be about six. Of course, my eyes are getting like this. And uh, I remember I had a short little South African man who was uh, my nurse at the time uh, there in ICU. He was willing to hold my hand. I, did, I tell you, I squeezed his hand for all it was worth. It's okay if you, men, it's okay if you can't face the needle, hold somebody's hand. Just don't break their hand. And uh, I had lost enough strength I didn't. But uh, anyway, that being said, I said, Lord, I'm going into this time. And I really need you to hold my hand. And I just, I didn't know how to face it. But I was crying out to God for help. We had, our, our pastor, my coworker, had a message uh, on Sunday. This is now, um, this is Wednesday, so just a few days after. It's from the book of Isaiah, and I was, he had said something that I thought, no, that's good. I want to go back and I want to read that passage. So I went to where I thought it was. Guess what? The passage wasn't there. But I found something else interesting. I found Isaiah 41, and I'd like you to turn there this evening. Tonight's message will be more of a testimony interspersed with my preaching, so bear with the personal side of it. But I believe there's purpose behind God giving me cancer that can be a help and an encouragement maybe to someone here tonight. And if it's not now, it may be in the future when you do need it, because we're all going to face difficult times. Isaiah chapter 41, God directed my attention to verse number 10. It says this, fear, now, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Let me just stop. I'm going to break this down. Instead of reading the whole thing, let me just break this down for us, okay? Uh, Section by section, phrase by phrase. I think that'll be easiest and we'll uh, be able to finish here on time. Fear thou not. We face things that we're afraid of. Fear is a natural human emotion, okay? But it is one that we must overcome. We can't live in fear. We know what Scripture says. God is not the one who gives us the spirit of fear, right? But of power and of love is sound. Okay, so fear is not from God, but it is a natural human emotion. And here God tells us, fear not. Now, why does he say this? What is it that I'm going to be able to use to overcome? Why? Because the doctor has the best advice? No. Because chemotherapy isn't as bad as they tell you? Absolutely not. It can be just as bad or worse. There is no reason why, humanly speaking, We could come to these words, fear not, fear thou not, and just go, okay, I don't have anything to fear. People tell me that needle is just a little prick. It's just a little, it's just a little poke and it's all done. Okay. Some of you, I want to take you into an airplane. You're afraid of heights, right? We all have fears we face. What is God's answer to our fear? He says this, for I am with thee. It is the presence of God. He is with us. That is the only thing that is going to conquer our fear. We cannot cannot overcome fear. Yes, perfect love casts out fear. We know that. Why? Because perfect love, God is love. He's with us. We don't go through our trials alone. I remember thinking about this very thought as I was going through chemotherapy and through all of the cancer things, the, the scans and everything. God is walking this journey with me. I don't have to do it alone. You know, I don't know what fears you face. 
I was, um, you know, we, we could talk about medical, we could talk about heights, we could talk about, you know, any number of things. You know, some people are very afraid to give out a gospel tract or knock on a door, uh, give an invitation. You've got uh, an event. Pastors encourage you to do s- some of that. Just fulfilling the Great Commission. Do you, do, you, do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 28? After telling them to go to make disciples, right? Teaching them, baptizing them, teaching them to observe. What's, what's he say after that? And lo, I'm with you always. I don't go to that door and knock on it alone. I don't give that tract alone. Right? Even the fear of knocking on someone's door or engaging someone in conversation, the answer is the eternal presence of God. His presence calms our fears. Now look at the next statement here. He says, be not dismayed. The word dismayed means bewildered or confused. And I can tell you, I was very confused. All of these questions and decisions and people asking me, what are you going to do? And obviously the big question for me was why? Why me? I knew other people, you know, have had gone through things like this, but why me? I've been healthy. All of a sudden now I'm sick. And it just happened that fast, it seemed. So, I'm confused. And we have all faced confusing times. We may not understand God's purpose, but here he gives the answer to it. He says, be not dismayed. Why? For I am thy God. And I started thinking about this. Well, you know, what does this mean for me? Maybe it's time we step back and actually consider his character, his works. Think on the person of our God. What he's done, who he is. It's not just that he is with me, it is who it is that is with me. You know, as, as, as I thought, I, I had one of my uh, supporting uh, pastors, the, the church that uh, supports us, the, their pastor sent an email to us reminding me of the, uh, the passage of Scripture where it speaks of the Lord is our healer. That's powerful. I didn't have to, I, I knew God was with me, but who is he? He's my healer. He's my provider. You know, he, he is everything that I need. And any time I face something that I thought was beyond me, I had someone right beside me. I remember probably the most comforting thing in those early days in the hospital, um, just waiting for the diagnosis, was Hebrews chapter 4. In that passage of Scripture, it became a very special uh, passage for me. But in Hebrews chapter 4, we read about our great high priest. That high priest, Jesus Christ, it says he is, now I, I know it uses kind of a double negative there, but so let me bring it back to the positive side so we understand a little more clearly. He is touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Jesus knows exactly what we're going through, and that was comforting, but you know what was even more comforting for me? It says he understands the feelings of our infirmities. He understood all of the range of emotions that I was going through. I wasn't just sitting there experiencing and going through the difficulty of waiting. He could understand the hurt, the anger, the bewilderment, whatever it was, right? The fears, the feelings of our infirmities. He was sympathizing with them. That's what that word means, touched. He's sympathizing with us in those times. So it's comforting to know that God is with us, but it is also comforting to know who it is that is with us, our God. Who is He? What has He done? Focusing on His person and character. As we were going through uh, this time, and as I was studying, I, I found myself running to the book of Psalms, as you could imagine. You're looking for comfort, you run to Psalms. And I, I decided at a, the suggestion of someone that I had been in, uh, found online, and I know that's dangerous from time to time, okay? 
Uh, but this one was, was safe, okay? This one was okay. But as I was reading this article, a, a person who had been in a situation similar, different cancer but similar, challenged his readers to go to Psalms and look for hope. All the words that are translated as hope or some variation of it. or So I went a little further. I have my Bible app, and I went and found all the Hebrew words. And it may not come out as the word hope or hopeful, but it might come out as trust, refuge, things like that, fortress, you know, whatever it may be. But I remember reading in Psalm 119, Scripture says there, the psalmist writing, he says, it has been good that I have been afflicted. That's hard when you're sitting in a bed of affliction to say. Sometimes you can look back and say that. But you know what I learned through the, the trial? Something that I've been told, but I had to take it by faith. God does everything right, and he makes no mistakes. My cancer was not an accident. It was not a mistake. God allowed it for a specific purpose. I don't know what that purpose is. But because I know who my God is, knowing that he went through that trial with me, I can also say, it has been good for me to have cancer. I don't understand it. And it may sound strange to hear it. It's strange for me to say it, but it's true. Because I know my God makes no mistakes. What he did was right. I needed to go through cancer. For myself, for others, I don't know, but I needed to go through it. He makes no mistakes. Then, following this statement, there are four promises. Three of them in this verse and one in a, in a later verse. He says this, I will strengthen thee. You know, going through something like that, and it doesn't have to be cancer. It can be a lot of things. You feel weak. Thankfully, the Apostle Paul went through a similar situation where he felt weak too. Remember his response, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that he received from the Lord? My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul even then goes on to say, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Not because there is strength in and of himself, no. But because he is given the strength from the Lord. I can't remember how many times I just felt weak. I'm still not at full strength, human strength. We'll say almost 90%. Okay? There were days I didn't even feel like I was 50%. I probably was, but I felt a lot worse, you know. You know, in every one of those times, God gave strength. It enabled me to do what I needed to do for that day, and it was many times a day by day by day. God gives strength. Every chemo treatment. I had a... Um, my treatments were on Thursdays, infusion, needles. I go in for the treatment. It was usually about two to three hours, uh, most often closer to the two and a half to three hour mark. Sometimes it was a little less. So um, we'd, I'd sit in there, and I felt pretty good through most of the treatment. Um, I'd come home, and I might feel okay for a few hours, but then... You start to feel it. And then, of course, 14 days of tablets, you're taking all of these uh, chemicals through your body, and it didn't help, right? So, you know, there was a, uh, I'd, I'd pull out of it. Usually what would happen is uh, Friday was, Friday through about Monday was my worst. Uh, that's when everything dipped and, and I didn't feel well. Then you kind of start pulling out of it slowly and uh, feel good, but then, um, and I do that for the, the tablets for about two weeks. God was with me every step of the way, giving strength 
and you know, I'm thankful I had my wife, but there were times even I felt bad that I couldn't do more. God gave me exactly what I needed in the time that I needed it. Strengthened me. The next one, he says, Yea, I will help thee. This, the, a lot of these, these promises, have, there's some overlap, right? Um, you know, I needed help, you know, and, and even thinking about, um, we had a, a woman was employed by the, um, by the oncology center. She was kind of a support um, liaison type thing where she would try to encourage, see how you're doing. And, she, I mean, humanly speaking, she, she was good at her job. But before, we had just met with the oncologist. I hadn't even started treatments yet, and she encouraged us to have a kind of a support group, some people around us that could help. And, you know, friends and family were here, supporting churches were here. Um, I was there. We had our church family on that side. But, again, their life was continuing. There were days that just felt like it was my wife and I. Um, you know, and even through that, those times, and thankfully, we'd have people calling, people checking in, uh, sometimes physically from our South African friends, and then uh, some of the missionaries, and then we'd have people checking in by email, you know, uh, just, just finding out how things are going. Um, but you know, there were days that whatever support we had, um, it wasn't enough. And yet God says, he'll help us. And he did. There were times, that, days of discouragement. I just needed God's help. Went on through this next statement here, and it says, and again, it overlaps here. He says, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Sounds kind of like that verse I was looking for in Psalms. By the way, it wasn't in Psalms. You'll find that out quickly. You know, those times of discouragement when I thought I needed that extra support. My wife was trying hard. And um, there were times we wept together. There were times that we prayed together. Uh, just sometimes I just said, leave me alone. I just needed to be alone with the Lord or didn't feel well discouraged, like I said, apologizing. I'm so sorry I put you through this. It's not your fault, you know. It's not like I caused cancer in my own body. But whenever I was feeling discouraged, this portion of this verse was made real. God, not, he, up, he upheld me with his right hand, the hand, the arm of strength. He sustained us. You know, it would have been very easy many times to give up and quit. To just come home. It would have been easy to just, in some way, I, again, I, well, let me back up. My grandfather had a similar cancer, colon cancer. It ended up spreading. and He was much older than I was when we were both, when we were respectively diagnosed. But I watched him suffer through it. And that was many years ago. I, was, I wasn't sure if I could handle it. He did well. I wasn't sure. I, and I'm sure he felt the same way. And I heard stories during my t treatments of the struggles my grandfather went through, even though he's home with the Lord now. So it was, it, was a, it was a very difficult time. It would have been easy to just stop treatments. It would have been easy not to start them. There were a lot of things, but God sustained us all the way through. All the way through. We made it. We made it. We finished, right? Eight treatments. I thought I would never see the eighth one. I started eight. Got through that one. I'm down to seven. The next one, I'm down to six. I got six more, right? I'm counting down. So when, eventually, it, uh, it, uh, it seemed easier to, uh, all right. Or, oh, no, I'm sorry. I started at one. This is my first one. This is my second one. Then I wait a minute, let's count them down. That's what it was. So I knew when the last one was, I never thought I'd see the last one. I thought, oh, this is going to be terrible. God enabled us to get through all the way through, every step of the way. The Lord also directed my attention to verse 13. I love this. He said, for I, the Lord thy God, 
will hold thy right hand. As I said, that passage wasn't in Psalms, it was right here. And literally minutes after praying and asking God to hold my hand as I go into treatment to sustain me through uh, what was very likely going to be a very difficult time, God brings my attention right to this very passage. It came alive in those moments. And you've experienced some of those things too when you've gone through difficult times. The picture here that I see is of a small child reaching up, taking the hand of their father. It's just this little child and daddy walking down the road. Except for me, it was a small, weak, helpless child crying out to his heavenly father saying, I need you to hold my hand. It says he would hold my right hand. Now, again, the right arm is the arm of strength, generally speaking. What is that showing? My strength's not enough. I've got to have, and I'm even gripping, if you think about it in that picture, if I'm reaching my right hand up to grip my father's hand, I'm gripping his left. That's not the arm of the strength, but it's so much stronger than my right. Right? I'm reaching, grabbing, clinging, holding on to God. That picture of a child with his father holding his hand as they walk, you know, to me it just shows trust, security, that child feels safe. Shows the dependence on the father. And that's exactly what I felt. Going into every treatment. I don't know what you're facing. There's no way I can. I don't know what you will face. None of us know because that's still future. But if there's one thing that I know, I I am reminded of a verse of Scripture in Psalms. I don't want you to turn to it. I'm just going to remind us of it. It's in Psalm 62, and you can can look at it later in verse 8. And it reminds us uh, to trust in Him at all times. Friend, may we remind ourselves that God has repeatedly proven Himself to be trustworthy. We've heard it. And sometimes you have to go through difficult times to to really learn it. I'm a slow learner. Okay. I guess I needed to go through this the, the, the rough time to learn it. But the word trust him, that word trust is one of those words that has that idea of hope tucked into it. It means to hasten, to run. For refuge. How often do we wait before we go to God? Right? I'm just going to, for me, in this trial, I'm just going to take another pill. I think it's just, it's just something small. It's just a cold. It's just the flu. A, 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 another, another pill that will help. A little more rest. That's the way I am. I try to do it myself. If I can, I try to do it myself. How often do we go to God first? We just run to Him immediately. Father, help me. I don't know what I'm doing, but I need you to hold my hand. Get me through this. This word is often translated as hope. It says at all times, even when we we think we can or we can't handle the circumstances, but trust in Him regardless of the circumstances, just trust in Him. I find it easiest when the rug's pulled out because I have nowhere else to turn. When I have nowhere else to go but to God, that's to me the easiest. But it says this, pour out your heart before Him. We do that easily when that rug comes out. We do. I love this next statement. He says this, God is a refuge for us. The word refuge is a shelter, a place of hope. Trust. Run to Him for refuge. And then at the end, basically it says, in him you'll find a place of hope, a place of refuge. 
God has proven himself to be trustworthy and faithful in every circumstance. He's never failed. And I love that we started with that. Him. Jesus never fails. Go back and read those words. They're powerful words. He's never failed us. So why do we try to handle these things on our own? To face our fears on our own? Why is it that we take too long and we wait till we've tried everything else, then we go to God? Trust in Him at all times. These verses, this one in particular, the Isaiah passage, became the the passage of Scripture that I walked into every single treatment with. I latched onto these verses. They became dear to me. And maybe these verses won't be quite as special to you. But whatever the case is, we serve the same God. And he's still just as faithful. He will sustain you through all of your difficulties. He'll be there. He'll hold your hand. He'll give you the strength. He says this, and I'm done. He says this at the end of that verse. Verse 13, he says, fear not. And he repeats, I will help thee. We have no reason to fear. He's right there with us. We can trust him. Father, we thank you so much for simple truths. Unfortunately, for me, I needed to learn them in a very difficult time, under difficult circumstances. Father, I pray that tonight's message would be a help, would be an encouragement, would be a blessing to someone sitting here. They would learn some of the same truths that I have had to learn. And maybe there are others here who have already faced difficult things and they've learned these. May we remember what we've learned and not forget to run to you for refuge. You are our place of hope. We can trust you. Thank you, Father. You are a good God. You make no mistakes. Thank you for the good, for the bad. For it causes us, it forces us, it it tests us, it challenges us to trust you more. We pray for just your hand of blessing and the conclusion of this service. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Pastor. With every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody look around. Perhaps God has spoken to your heart. Say, Pastor, yeah, I need to learn to trust the Lord a little bit more. I have, I've been trying to get out of my situation, trying to do things on my own. I just need to trust the Lord. God spoke to my heart during the message tonight. Pastor, would you pray for me? Would you indicate that need just by slipping your hand up and slipping back down? I'll see your hand. God knows your heart's need. Yes, thank you for the hands throughout this building here tonight. Thank you. We slip them down. Maybe here tonight, and I don't know every single heart, but maybe you'd be honest and say, you know what? I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. I can't even trust Him through my trial because I've never trusted Him as my Savior. There's never been a time that I recall that I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone. God's spoken to my heart. Would you pray for me? Would you indicate that need just by slipping your hand up and slipping back down? I'll see your hand. God knows your heart's need. In just a moment, we're going to have Brother Salama sing as the pianist continues to play. But if God's spoken to your heart, I want to encourage you to come in just a moment. You're going to use these steps as an old-fashioned altar. Won't you come? Won't you come? Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts. Lord, help us to learn to trust you. Lord, I pray that you be honored and glorified in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless this invitation time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.